أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رضيت بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسولا ونبيا ربي أعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك ربي أن يحضرون ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Continuing on with the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام's military legendary legacy The era of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab After completing a total of 62 videos This will be video number 63 In completing a total of 50 videos The era of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab The legendary Uh, legendary uh, military legacy excuse me of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a total of 30 videos of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam's legendary military career we are now again on uh, video number 63 I believe uh, page number 334 in the era of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab legendary government military legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 3.2.4 patience patience in laying siege and this is in reference to again the conquest of Syria, Egypt and Libya and uh, the campaign uh, of Amr ibn al-As during the siege of Kiryun in Alexandria Amr relied on patience when he realized that it will be difficult to achieve victory over the Byzantines who had held up in their fortresses in Kiryun he tried once to launch an attack but the attack failed so he continued with skirmishes and waited for the passage of time the defenders weariness and exhaustion of supplies and arms and men's patience to take effect this is indeed what happened after the siege of kiryon and had lasted for more than 10 days the byzantines realized the muslims were determined to carry on with the siege then they realized that they had no alternative but to surrender and hand over the fortress to the attackers the same thing happened during the siege of alexandria except that in the latter case the siege lasted for a longer time which was three months because the byzantines were fully aware that this was the last chance for their army and indeed for all of them if they fell in alexandria then they would fall in egypt and all of north africa and this is exactly what happened 3.3 Sending the good news of the conquest to the Khalifa, Amr ibn al-As sent Muawiyah ibn Khadij to Umar ibn al-Khattab with the good news of the conquest. Muawiyah said to him, why don't you write a letter to send with me? Amr said to him, why don't, why do I need to write a letter? Are you not an Arab man who can convey the message? Did you not see anything? When he came to Umar, he told him of the conquest of Alexandria. And Umar fell down in prostration and said, Praise be to Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, Muawiyah ibn Khadij told of how he conveyed the good news of the victory to the Khalif. When Amr ibn al-As sent me to Umar ibn al-Khattab, I reached the mosque and whilst I was sitting there, a slave woman came out of the house of Umar ibn al-Khattab and saw me looking tired, worried, traveling clothes. She came to me and asked, Who are you? I said, I am Muawiyah ibn Khadij, the envoy of Amr ibn al-As. She went away when she came rushing back and I could hear the rushing of her izar against her legs. When she came up to me, she said, Get up and answer the Khalif for he is calling you. I followed her and when she went in there, I saw Umar ibn al-Khattab holding his rida in one hand and tying his izar with another hand. He asked, what news do you have? I said, good news, O Amir al-Mu'minin, Allah has granted us victory in Alexandria. He took me out to the mosque and said to me, Mu'addin, call out to the people, as salatul jamia prayer is about to begin. Then he said to me, stand up and tell your companion. So I stood up and I told him that he prayed and went into his house and turned to face the Qibla and said dua. Then he sat down and said, O oh, slave woman, is there any food? She brought some bread and oil and he said, eat. I ate only a little because I felt shy. He said, eat for the traveler loves food. If I wanted to eat, I would eat with you. I felt shy, but I ate a little. Then he said, why did you say, what did you say? O oh, Muawiyah, when you came to the mosque, I said, I thought perhaps the Khalif is taking a nap. He said, that is not the right thing to say or to think. 
If I slept during the day, I would have neglected the people. And if I slept during the night, I would have neglected myself. How can I sleep when I have the, these two concerns, O Muawiyah? From this report, we may conclude that the mask in the earliest period of Islam was the most important means of conveying information as the Muslims would gather there when they heard news. When they heard the call, excuse me, Salatul Jami'ah, that the prayer is about to begin, this call meant that there was some important information to be conveyed to the Muslimin. When they gathered, military, political, or social statements would be read out to them. We also learned from this report something about the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab when he saw the Khalif, when he was the Khalif, excuse me, of the Muslimin. As he said to Muawiyah ibn Khadij, if I slept during the day, I would have neglected the people, and if I slept during the night, I would have neglected myself. How can I sleep when I have these two concerns of Muawiyah? This points to the, his complete awareness of the rights of his own self and the rights of others. If a Muslim can combine both, then he will be one of the righteous and pious people. 3.4. Amas Kin is to fulfill promises when the Muslims reach Bilhib and their prisoners reach Yemen. The governor sent word to Amr ibn al-As saying, I used to give the jizya to those who were more hated to me than you, the Persians and the Byzantines. If you want me to pay the jizya in return for giving back to me what you have taken of my land, I will do that. Amr wrote to Amr ibn al Khattab asking permission to do that and they suspended fighting until they received Omar's response. The answer came back from Omar indeed ongoing. Jizya is dearer to us than booty which is divided and then is as if it never existed. As for the prisoners, if their king gives you jizya on condition that you give the prisoners the choice between al-Islam and the religion of their people, then whoever chooses Islam is one of the Muslims and whoever chooses the religion of his people impose the jizya on him. As for those who are scattered in other lands, we could, could not return them. Amr made this offer to the ruler of Alexandria and he accepted it. They gathered the prisoners and the Christians gathered and they gave them the choice one by one. When someone chose Islam, they said takbir, and when someone chose Christianity, they groaned and imposed the jizya until they were finished. This is regarded as evidence of the sincerity of the Sahaba. May Allah Ta'ala Jalla Jalaluhu be pleased with them all, as they were unconcerned about worldly affairs and were focused on the hereafter. They were genuinely keen to guide people to al Islam because the prisoners entered Islam did not bring the Muslims any benefit in worldly terms terms, whereas if they continue to follow the religion, that would bring some worldly gains as they would be obliged to pay the jizya to the Muslimin. Despite that, we see that Umar bin Khattab ordered that the prisoners be given the choice between becoming Muslims or paying the jizya. When the order was implemented, the Sahaba and those who were with them said takbir with more favor, favor than favor than they had during the conquest wherever one of those Christians chose Al-Islam and they were distressed when someone chose to continue following their own religion. It is also worth noting the commitment of the Sahaba to the deal that had been worked out which is clear from the statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab in his letter, as for those who are scattered in other lands, we cannot return them. According to another report, he said, we do not want to make a peace deal with him that is based on conditions that we cannot fulfill. Umar looked at his ability to fulfill conditions before concluding any deal with the enemy so that the Muslimin would not be in a position of being unable to fulfill the conditions. This attitude is indicated of the indicative of the high degree of sincerity, which is one of the elements of victory, because the one who excuse me as we move on to page number 338 as for one who commits himself to something and then is unable to fulfill it may be excused but if he thinks about it and tries to take precautions so that he will not find himself unable to fulfill the conditions this is a sign of foresight in good management Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As Amr set off with his army towards Alexandria and on the way there was some fighting between him and the people of that land in which the Muslims were victorious. It may be noted that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As was wounded many times in his battles with the people of Kiryon. A messenger came to him from his father to ask him about his wounds and Abdullah said in, an, uh, in a verse, poetry, I say to myself, when the pain grows intense, be patient for soon, you will be praised or blamed. 
The messenger went back to Amr and told him what he had said. Amr said, he is truly my son. This was an attitude of patience. This was an attitude of patience and forbearance on the part of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, who was well known for his knowledge and worship, which he continued with courage and patience in the face of hardship. 3.6. A house that was built for the Khalif in Egypt. Amr ibn al-As sent word to Amr ibn al-Khattab, telling him, we have built a house for you next to the Jami Mosque. Omar wrote back, radiallahu anhu, saying, I am a man who lives in the Hijaz. Why would I have a house in Egypt? And he commanded him to t- to make it into a marketplace for the Muslimin. This is indicative of the restraint of the Khalifa and his ascetism with regard to outward worldly matters. If leaders and rulers put themselves above the matters of this world and its transient pleasure, then it is more appropriate than those who are below them should also shun such things. 3.7. The chain. Or, excuse me, 3.7, the claim that the Muslimin burnt the library of Alexandria. Dr. Abdul Rahim Muhammad Abdul Hamid said, We did not find any text or indicative that Amr ibn al-As burnt the library of Alexandria. All there is is a text by Ibn al-Qafti, quoting from, Amr, from Ibn al Abari, Abari, which says Yahya al Nawawi, who was from Alexandria and lived until the city of Alexandria was conquered by Amr bin al As, went to see Amr. He was known for his knowledge, so Amr honored him and heard from him philosophical words with which the Arabs were not familiar. Ibn al Afti completed the story by saying, Amr said to him, Why do you what? do you want from us? He said, the books of wisdom that are in the royal stores. 45,120 volumes. Amr thought that Yahya had meant, or what Yahya had mentioned was too much and he said, I cannot issue such an order without asking permission from the Khalif. He wrote to Amr and told him what Yahya had said and Amr wrote back saying, as for the books which you have mentioned, if what is in them is in according, in, in according so, if what is in those books are in accordance with the book of Allah, then we should be content with the book of Allah. If what is in them is contrary to the book of Allah, then we have no need of them. So go ahead and destroy them. Amr ibn al as started distributing the books uh, to the bath houses of Alexandria where they were burnt in the, sto- in the stoves. And I was told the number of bathhouses at that time, but I forgot. They said that it took six months to burn them all. So listen to what happened and be amazed. But the story of the book burning was narrated from Ibn Al-Qafti. And before Ibn Al-Abari, Abdul Latif Al-Baghdadi from 649 AH 1231 CE said, It was a house of knowledge that was built by Alexander when he built the city in which were stored the books that were burned by Amr ibn al-As with the permission of Umar ibn al-Khattab. But if we study these reports, we must note the following points. Number one, there is no connection between these three reports or between their narrators, even though they lived in a similar time frame. Number two, there is no isnad to which these reports can be attributed. Rather, they reflect assumptions that are made by the authors. Number three, these reports were written at a time that was distant from the conquest of Egypt and the time of Amr ibn al-As. So we may say with all certainty that this story is obviously fabricated and the following criticism may be made. Number four, the story of the burning of the library of Alexandria is not mentioned by those who wrote the history of Egypt and its conquest, who lived many centuries before those who wrote the story. Number five, the story is not mentioned by Al-Waqidi, At-Tabari, Ibn Athir, or Ibn Qaldum, let alone Ibn Abdul Hakam, and it is not mentioned by Yaqut al Hamawi in his description of Alexandria. Number six, this story can be traced back to the time of crusades through al-Baghdadi, who may have been fabricating it under pressure or it may have been fabricated later on and attributed to him. Number seven, if the so-called library ever existed, then we may say that the Byzantines who left Alexandria could have taken it with them and they probably did do that. Number eight, Amr could have thrown the books into the sea within a very short time instead of burning them, which supposedly took six months. This points to the purpose behind the fabrication of this story. We can say without any hesitation that Umar ibn al-Khattab and Amr ibn 
us are innocent of what has been attributed to them in this fabricated story, which stems from the imaginations of people who love to exaggerate, so they imagine things that did not happen. 3.8. The meeting between Amr ibn al-As and the page Patriarch of Bin Yamin, the historian Ibn Abdul Hakam said in Alexandria there was a Coptic bishop called Abu Bin Yamin who had fled into the desert because of the religious persecutions by the Copts who were suffering at the hands of the Christian Byzantines. When they heard that Amr ibn al As came to Egypt, he wrote to the Copts telling them that the Byzantines no longer had a hold on power and their dominion had come to an end. And he told them to welcome Amr. It was said that the Copts who were in Al Farma became helpers of Amr on that day, according to a report by the Coptic historian. Moving along now to page number 342, Sawaris ibn al Muqanna Sanutus. Sanutus, uh, one of the Coptic leaders at that time who was in charge of the church affairs during the absence of Page Artric bin Yamin told Amr where the Page Arch bin Yamin was and that he had fled from Byzantines fearing them. Amr ibn al As wrote a letter to his agents in Egypt telling them where bin Yamin, the Page Arch, Arch of the Christian Coptic was and that he had a covenant and a promise of protection and safety from Allah so let him come in safety and tend to the affairs of his church and his people. When the Bishop bin Yamin heard of that he returned to Alexandria with great joy after having been absent for 13 years. When he appeared the people and the entire city rejoiced at his coming. When Amr learned of his arrival he ordered that he be brought to him with full honor and respect and when he saw him he honored him and said to his companions in all the cities that that we have taken possession of. Up till now, I have not seen a man like this one. The page arch, Binyamin, was very handsome and well-spoken with a tranquil and dignified manner. Then Amr turned to him and said, Take care of all your churches and men. They are all under your control and you may manage their affairs. Professor Ash Sharqawi commented on this meeting by saying Amr kept the page arch uh, bin Yamin close to him until he became one of his dearest friends and the Arabs who had conquered Egypt began to feel at ease. The governor Amr ibn al As addressed him on the occasion of the first Jumu'ah prayer in the Fustat and said, Treat the cops who are your neighbors well, for you owe them protection and are connected to them by marriage. So refrain from harming them, refrain from looking at their women folk and lower your gaze. Important lessons from the conquest of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The nature of the Islamic conquest, some orientalists, orientalists, and Christian historians have attempted to misrepresent the Islamic conquest at the time of the righteously guided Khalifas. They claimed that the conquest were religious was and said that the Muslims were people of faith, but they were fanatics who subjugated the people and made them accept their principles by means of force and indulging in ruthless bloodshed. They claimed that they carried the Quran in one hand and the sword in another hand. Among those who focused on this idea was Sidio, Mu'ir, and Nupur. Nur quotes Nupur as saying, For the survival of Al-Islam, it was essential that it continue with its aggressive plans and enforced by the sword its demand that all people into al-islam or at least spread its influence internationally but it is inevitable for any religion that is that its followers will prefer war at some stage and this was the case with al-islam but they claim that the muslims aim to spread their faith by force or that they were more aggressive than others is a claim that must be completely rejected some orientalists refuted this accusation and described the Islamic conquest as being based on sublime attitude. Von Kremer said, In there was the Muslim Arabs embodied good attitudes. The Prophet wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, forbade them to kill monks, women, children, uh, 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 and the blind or handicapped as he also forbade them to destroy crops or cut down trees. Uh, the Muslimin uh, followed these instructions to the letter in their wars. They did not violate any sanctuaries or destroy any crops. The Byzantine used to shoot 
poisoned arrows at them, but they did not respond in kind against their enemies. Uh, pillaging towns and setting fire to them was a normal practice of the Byzantine army, whether it was advancing or retreating, but the Muslims adhered to, uh, to their ideals and did not try to do any of these things. Rosen Paul said the Islamic State expanded into other lands, calling others to the faith and engaging in debate with other intellectual movements that were in existence, but above all, the advance of Islam demolished the ancient barriers of language and custom and provided a rare opportunity to all people and civilizations to start a new intellectual life that was based on absolute equality in a spirit of free competition. The historical reality show that the Muslims did not force anyone to embrace Al-Islam because they adhere to the word of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu where he says there is no compulsion in religion. Verily the right path has become distinct from the wrong path. Whoever disbelieves in taghut, falsehood, uh, uh, false gods, idols and so on and believes in Allah then he has grasped the most Whoever disbelieves in taqut, false gods, idols, and believes in Allah, then he has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that will never break. And Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, is all hero, all knower. Surah number 2, ayah number 256. The reason why people can revert it to Al-Islam was what they saw in Al-Islam itself, which was a great blessing, and what they saw in the Muslims who embodied Islamic attitudes and adhered to the teaching commands and prohibitions of the faith, and what they saw in the commanders and troops who called others by means of their deeds and actions, the attitudes of these soldiers, was the noblest attitude ever known in history of the world. The Khalifs and commanders urged their troops to seek the help of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in Fear, to fear Allah Jalla Jalaluhu as well, to give precedent to the hereafter over this world, to be sincere in jihad, to seek the pleasure of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in whatever they did and to keep away from sin. They had a strong desire to save nations and individuals from servitude to other people so that they might become slaves of Allah and to bring them out of the constrictions of this world to the vastness of the hereafter. The Muslim leaders marched at the head of their armies receiving the first blows in the battles of jihad and many of them were martyred and the leaders used to march at the back of the army at times of safety so as to show kindness to them carry burdens and help the weak the leaders were first and foremost da'iyas in other words they were missionaries to call people to islam who implemented the principles of islamic warfare in full indeed the Muslims fought in jihad for the sake of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and did not wage war as other states used to do. 4.2 Omar's method of selecting commanders for the army. Omar had a distinct method of selecting leaders for the conquest. He stipulated a number of conditions and guidelines for choosing commanders for his troops which were as follows 4.2.1 they should be pious and righteous with knowledge of islamic ruling he used to say whoever appoints an evildoer knowing that he is an evildoer is just like him when he sent word to saeed moving along now to page number 346 when he sent a uh, word to saeed ibn amir appointing him as governor in some parts of syria saeed refused the post omar said no by the one in whose hands is my soul do not lay all the burden on my shoulders and sit in your house 4.2.2 the commander should be known for deliberation and caution when omar ibn al-khattab appointed abu ubaid al thaqafi he said to him nothing prevented me from appointing sulayt except the fact that he Rush to fight and rushing to fight may lead to loss, except when it is based on sound calculation by Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, and not for his haste. I would have appointed him, but nothing is right in war except deliberation. 4.2.3 he should be daring and brave and skilled in archery. When Omar ibn al-Khattab wanted to appoint a leader for the Muslim armies to conquer Nahawan, he consulted the people and they said, O oh, Amir al-Mu'minin, you know more about the people of Iraq and your troops have come to you and you have seen them and spoken to them. He said by Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, I shall appoint over them a man who will be the most courageous in battle when they meet the enemy tomorrow. They ask, who is it, O Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, a Nu'man ibn Muqram al-Muzani. They said, he is able for it. Uh, 
Point four, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, your right over me is that I should never send you on a fatal mission or keep you at the border post for too long. When Amr ibn al-Aiz and his troops faced the Byzantines in the battle of Ajnadin, the Byzantine commander al-Artaboon was the smartest of the Byzantines, a man of deep insight and caution who had assembled a huge army in Ailea and Ramla. Amr wrote to Amr with the news, and when his letter arrived, Amr said, We have sent the Artaboon of the Arabs against the Artaboon of the Byzantines. Let us see how things will turn out. But Amr wanted to gather information about, about Al-Artaboon and his army so that he could devise a wise plan of attack and defeat him. Ibn Al-As entered the camp of the Byzantine leader and was almost killed, but Allah saved him. Amr ibn al as tricked the Artaboon. And when news of that reached Amr ibn al-Khattab, he said, Amr has defeated him. What a smart man Amr is. Uh, inshallah, we will, we will stop here on uh, at the bottom of page number 347. And uh, be picking it up from there. We still have a little way to go, but not uh, very much. I think lessons in morals uh, will take up a lot of it, and then uh, we will get into the circumstances of the uh, the uh, the stabbing or the assassination of Sayyidina Umar ibn al Khattab. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa tabarak asmu rabbika wa ta'ala jadduk wa la ilaha ghayruk wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al alim al azim. Subhanak Rabbika Rabbil Izzati amma yasifuna wa salamun ala al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi Rabbil alameen.